Why should we care about story? People never buy the product, they buy the story that's attached to it. Not just the story that you're telling, but rather the story that people are telling themselves about what that thing means to them. Talk to me about positioning, differentiation, and X factor, and how we can apply that in our business. Those are three really big words, positioning, X factor, and differentiation. What do you mean? Tell me more about this. If you're worried about that race to the bottom of commodification, the only way forward for all of us is to seek and find higher ground. That's positioning, differentiation, and X factor. The most powerful way to unlock X factor, the only thing that nobody can compete against is your story. As you all know, I'm super fascinated by story. I have this theory, and I don't think it's an, a unique or original theory, is that all memory is tied to a strong emotion, and that emotion is also tied to a story. So I dare you right now, try to think of a memory without telling me a story and an emotion. Probably not possible. That's why I'm super excited to have Michael on the show today. He and I chatted briefly before this on a different call, and he was telling me about these different ideas and things he's been doing the last 10, 20 years of his life. So I'm really excited to have Michael. Michael, welcome to the show. Please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm Michael Margolis. I'm the founder of Storied. And um, I believe that uh, narrative is the number one superpower of humanity. Um, and for the last 20 years, I've been helping visionaries, leaders, and creatives uh, tell a bigger story about the future. Um, these days, we have uh, courses, coaching, and community um, that's basically helping anybody take charge of their story. I'm already a big fan of the concept. I'm yeah. learning about who you are. But there are people who are like, story, story shmory, why should we even care? Let's start there. Let's make sure people are like on the same train as us before it takes off here. Why should we care about story? Yeah. So a few things. I think the first one is people never buy the product. They buy the story that's attached to it. And not just the story that you're telling, but rather the story that people are telling themselves about what that thing means to them. Um, a great example of this, one of my favorite TV guilty pleasures is um, Pawn Stars. If you ever watch the show, right? It's a 24-hour pawn shop in Las Vegas, Nevada, three generations of a family who own the business. People bring different curios and items they'll get at a garage sale or from the attic, and we find out their story. And in the process, they're either going to pawn it or sell it. Well, so imagine for a moment, if I had, you know, this imaginary Zippo lighter, right? Like how much is it worth? Well, if it's a, you know, circa 2022 Zippo lighter, it's maybe 15 or 20 bucks. But what if it's a World War II Zippo lighter? Okay. Now it's maybe worth a couple hundred bucks. Well, what if it's actually like my, my, my great, great uncle, General George Marshall's Zippo lighter? And I have a photo, black and white, of him smoking a celebratory cigar on D-Day with that lighter. Now it might be worth a couple thousand bucks, right? Or priceless. It's the same hunk of metal, right? With a wick and, you know, butane. Like the object's the same, but in each of the three examples, there's a different story that's attached to it. And we might call him the expert before, you know, you go spend a few thousand bucks on this thing. And the expert says it's worth $5,000. But if we took a poll of an audience and said, okay, how many of you want to buy this for $1,000 right here on the spot? Most people won't take the deal. Why? Well, maybe you don't smoke. Maybe you're not into like war or World War II. Um, maybe you have no idea where to find someone to sell it to kind of do arbitrage on it, right? There's all these reasons of why you would exit out of the story, right? But for a certain person, they would identify and want to be a part of the story. And this is true of everything in life. Um, and it's something we almost take it for granted. We're sort of invisible to it. Um, but again, nobody's buying the product. They're buying the story that's attached to it. And, and not just what you're, the story you're telling, but the story they're telling themselves of what that means to them. I think you raised up a, a few really good points. It's not just your story, but the story that exists in the mind of the other person. So it might be a family heirloom and it's deeply connected. It's like in Pulp Fiction and Butch's father passed, uh, dies in the Vietnam War. <laughs> That's and right. And he's given the watch. Uh, the watch and he had to carry it through uh, extraordinary means. And then in the middle of all this danger, 
he argues with his girlfriend. It's like, where's my watch? He goes, it was right there. I put it. He goes, where's my watch? And he's being hunted by everybody, but he's going to risk personal, well, his personal welfare because he, the watch means something to him. Now you and I, it's like, no, it's been through a lot. I don't want that watch. I wouldn't even take it for free. But for Butch, it meant everything. Yeah. So the story is the meaning that we attach to things uh, and to everything that, that's in our lives. What is another example of a story that we've all agreed to that has meaning to us, but has actually no, no value at all? I mean, look, it plays out in all sorts of ways, you know, like, I mean, here's my wedding band, right? This is just a hunk of metal. You know, if I were to yeah. sell it, it would only be sold for scrap gold, right? Even though it, it's priceless to me personally, um, you know, or, um, you know, some people collect wine. I collect chocolate. I think I was telling you about this, right? Rare, exotic, single origin craft chocolate. I used to traffic in kilos of it, okay? Like I geek out on chocolate. I'm the kind of person I'll spend $20, $50. I've spent $250 on one bar of chocolate, Wow. right? Most people think that's freaking nuts. But for me, like the provenance, the rarity, like there was a story behind it that meant something to me. And it also delivered on the, on the, you know, on the, the price value equation, but most people would never spend $250 or $50, but you might spend 20 or 10, but that's a pretty bougie bar of chocolate. It is. You're a little yeah. nuts about chocolate for sure. Uh, and before we lose anybody, yeah. what does provenance mean? It's an important word for us to understand because it's connected to story. Yeah. So provenance is, is, is basically story of place where something comes from. Um, and, and in the world of food, provenance literally goes into the taste of a place. So mm. when it comes to um, uh, like in Italy, they have these um, like AOCs, which, um, or I think that may be the French, the frame, the French label of it, but it's, it's the way that different regions around the world have branded that specific place like Parmigiano, like Reggiano, it's like cheese that can only be called that that comes from that that's made in that region, right? Um, and, and the same is true for um, uh, um, different kinds of wines, right? So different wines have labels on that and so on. Um, and it's literally the taste of a place and the belief that it's in the terroir, it's in the soil, it's in the water, it's it's, 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 it's that ineffable thing. Um, just in the same way that like pizza only like in New York, the, like you cannot replace or, or copy New York city pizza, right. Cause of the taste of the place. Um, you know, I don't know if it's the water, I don't know if it's, you know what it is, but you can't beat a New York city slice of pizza. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this, but is that just a story or is that real? You know, I mean, look, I lived in New York for about six years and it's real, my friend. Um, <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> you, you have to say that as a former New Yorker. I mean, they'll throw you out. They'll take the your New Yorker card back. But It's the truth. I mean, there's some good pizza sure? here in L.A. There's some there's some respectable pizza here in L.A., but yeah. they're just there's something about New York pizza. I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, so blind taste test, are you willing to bet a million dollars that two really good slices of pizza, you can say this one's definitely from New York? Yes. Really? Now, now, mind you, I have, I have an advantage. I, my father is a mad scientist and inventor in the food tech industry. He mm -hmm. worked for Nestle for, for many decades. It's, you know, it's part of my story behind chocolate. I grew up in Switzerland as a kid, all this and that. So I have, I have that sixth sense taste where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to taste things that other people don't taste. And, and I'm sort of pretty obnoxious about it. You, you don't want to go to a restaurant with me. Let's just say that I'm that guy, you know, <laughs> that's asking the questions and like, Oh, this is so amazing. And I'll start telling <laughs> stories and whatever else. And so either you're like into it or you're not. <laughs> right. Okay. You, you've opened up a can of worms and this we is how we're going to begin this conversation. Totally. There's lots for me to pick apart here. So when it comes to the origin or where something comes from, like champagne only comes from champagne because that's a place in France. Kobe beef comes from a place called Kobe in Japan, and they will sue you if you try to call it Kobe beef, right? And that's why they invented something else, but we won't go there. But to, to the point of your wedding band, okay, there's a lot of sentimental value. There's a story about how you guys came together, about the strength of your relationship, about the promises you've made. Then there's the gold part, which is like when you said it would be melted down for scrap and it'll be sold for whatever gold is sold for. Now, the real question is, why is gold valuable? 
Now, what I understand about value is there's two parts, and maybe I'm, I, I might have missed one of these things. There's the utility value, which water has high utility value. And then there's exchange value. Water's not worth much, even though it's the necessary part of life. And if you're really thirsty, you'll give anything to have some water. But it has fairly low exchange value. Whereas gold, the store we've all told ourselves, it does happen to be the rarest element on earth. One of the rarest elements on earth. I learned that through the History Channel, I believe. <laughs> so it has some utility. It's a good conductor, yeah. but not the best. Yeah. You know, it has certain properties to it. But really, it's just because we all have collectively, as humanity, said gold is worth a lot. But if you abstract that, when the U.S. left the gold standard many, many years ago, now we all carry around these pieces of paper that have low utility but have high exchange value because as long as we agree to it, then it has value. But the minute our faith and confidence in the U.S. currency wanes, which it may be in that state today, then all of a sudden that's just now a piece of paper. So the story matters a lot. Here's what you're tapping into. And this is, you know, we've taken the, the red pill, so to speak here, because we're literally looking at the matrix of life is that every experience, every object, every relationship is stored in the mind with a story that's attached to it. And what you're starting to tap into, this is something that I really geek out on that 99% of most books and trainings on storytelling overlook, which is actually the difference between story versus narrative. All right. So what you're actually talking about is a narrative, mm, okay. like the narrative that, for instance, you know, this, um, you know, I'm going to open up my wallet here and okay, I literally, I only have one bill in my wallet, right? Because we don't even deal with paper, paper currency anymore, but I've got a $5 bill, right? But like the narrative that, that this, that this thing is a, is a currency of exchange of value, um, we, we have many different narratives that run our lives. Um, most of the time, we tend to focus on story. Story is a single event. It's got a beginning, middle, and end. It's a closed loop. It's something that happened. Whereas a narrative is a more abstract shared belief. Um, and when you start to understand this, it's like um, the narrative is a Christmas tree and the stories are the ornaments that go on the Christmas tree. Like uh, my favorite example of this is the American dream. The American dream is a narrative, right? And as an abstract concept or belief, it means a land of opportunity. It means um, you can reinvent yourself. Um, you know, it means, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different concepts related to the American dream, right? But then each of us have our own individual stories about the American dream. Like, for instance, my father, you know, he was born and raised in the bush of Africa, Right. And he got a Fulbright to the States, came in the late 60s, you know, and became naturalized as a U.S. citizen in the 19, early 1970s, first generation immigrant. You know, he still gets misty eyed when the national anthem comes on. He's more patriotic than my mother, who was actually born and raised in the States. Right. So this difference between story versus narrative, we, we, we are drowning in a, in a sea of infinite stories Yet we have very few shared collective narratives, especially for the change that we're going through in the world right now. Um, so a lot of the work we do is, is helping people to think in narrative and then create a unifying shared narrative that transcends the differences or the conflict of where, where people basically are, are opting out or exiting out of whatever message that you might be communicating. Mm, you're making a pretty important distinction here. So let me make sure I understand that story is individual it's concrete and it, it th there's a certain specificity to it narrative is shared broader and abstract yes is that the key difference here exactly a story has a beginning middle and end it's an event it's an anecdote it's this thing that happened right it's a closed loop a narrative is a more abstract concept it doesn't necessarily have a beginning or an end like when did the american dream start does it start in 1776? I don't think so, right? Like, right, it's it's a little fungy and there's concepts within the American dream that go all the way back to ancient Egypt and one could argue like, or in Greece and all these kinds of things, right? It's an open loop. I'd love to connect this to your passion around the future, right? Which is the following. Um, you know, we live in a society that's obsessed with data. I work with a lot of technical driven organizations, like the biggest tech companies on the planet where like data is king, Okay. Data 
is a story of the past, right? Whereas disruption is a story about the future. So we have to start with the future first, and then we use the past, the data to legitimize and validate the future we're trying to create. Most of us have that order or sequence the wrong, turned upside down. We're constantly looking backwards instead of looking forwards. And, and this is where we trap ourselves within a past story or within even an existing narrative that may not be the right story for the future we're trying to create. It's a, it's a paradigm shift, but once people get that, they realize, holy crap, this is, this is why the, the narr- like this, you know, it's kind of like that old saying, like the, you know, the, the, the thing that got you to here isn't the thing that gets you to next. So like the story that got you to here isn't the story that gets you to next. I, I fully hundred percent align with that. You just described it in a very different way, but it's something I've talked to people about before, about how, when we set goals, most people do it in a forensic way. They look backwards and say, well, if this has happened in the last five years, then the next five years will look just like this. And you and I, and any historian knows that that's absolutely not freaking true. Otherwise there would be no disruption. There would be no innovation. So instead we look to the future about the kind of goals we want to set. And then we look at what can support that. And we invent whatever we need to, to get to that place. And they sound the same, but they're radically different. They're so different. What you're speaking to is, is what I, what I've come to discover is one of the first principles. It's a, it's one of the fundamental universal principles of innovation, disruption, and transformation. And it's, it's, it's sort of like one of the secrets hiding in plain sight um, for any of us who are leading change or doing something that's new and different. You're, you're being hired for your possibility mindset, the ability to see and name the possibilities and the opportunities amidst change, amidst constraints. Um, but we often are leading with the data, trying to prove and validate something and trying to posture instead of widening the aperture and, and, and really unlocking the, the creative mojo um, and the generativeness in any situation. So while we're on this, yeah. I have to ask this question, then what is the role of research as it relates to innovation? How do we balance that? Because it seems like the more mired we are in research, yeah. the less likely we are to innovate. I might get myself into trouble here. I'm um, hoping you will. Okay. I have an inherent bias and for better and for worse, but I find that that the majority of research is garbage and is a distraction in that, um, like when I'm working with narrative and, um, and, and just to kind of give everyone listening sort of, sort of some context, um, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, much of my work has been inside the biggest tech companies on the planet. We're talking Google, Facebook, Uber, Shopify, and helping those executives and teams literally sell the future and and how they do it internally. So building those kinds of presentations of translating the strategy. But in the meantime, I've also worked with like every kind of creative, independent consultant coach, like, you know, the whole creator economy and like all of that. So like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cut from the same cloth as you and many, many in your community, Chris. Here's what I've learned how, working with narrative is that when you're looking to work and change the narrative, you have to index to power, permission, and authority. Like there's an old saying that Plato has, it's also attributed to the Hopi Indians, which is those who tell the stories rule the world. So the thing about story and narrative is very few of us think that we have permission to tell the bigger story. That's the biggest obstacle to this. And so if you are going to go and, and change the narrative within a, for a product, an organization, a team, I always focus on I have to work with the most senior authorized leader of the organizational system, and I'm indexing for conviction. Conviction actually is the currency. Conviction is the way that basically belief becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And, um, and, and you start from that place. Where's the inherent conviction in the system that, that the conviction about the future? And then once we have that, once we have that, um, basically the, you know, we have a thesis about that. We can go test and validate that thesis with research. 
right? But too often people lead with research, which is basically outsourcing, well, I don't know, right? And, and it's great to come from a place of like not knowing or like, I don't know what I don't know, fair and valid. But when it comes to like actual leadership or driving change or repositioning a brand, those kinds of things, you got to start with conviction because if, if the conviction doesn't exist in the organizational system, the world's best research in the world is going to rot on the vine. And I know a lot of researchers have experienced this, right? Like you do this amazing work and then people won't buy into it because they don't see it. They don't feel it. They don't believe it. Um, so that's the piece. It, it goes back to belief. And, and we have to start with where's the existing belief and the people who have the power to, to sort of promulgate those beliefs, kind of reinforce the beliefs and or evolve those beliefs. Does that make sense? What do you think? It does, but I want to get back to a point that I think you yes. were making about, and you said some pretty bombastic things. It was like, I, I, I don't know if this exact quote, but research is garbage and worthless. Like, were you going to expand on that? Because I do want you to talk about that. Yeah. Well, like I said that, um, I said a lot, all right, or, yes. or a lot of research is in that it, um, and then my caveat that I then explained is actually research is really valuable once you actually have the guts to put a stake in the ground and say, here's the thesis. Here's what we think matters. Here's what we think is true. Great. Now let's go test and validate that. Too often times people do this open-ended research fishing expeditions that basically comes back with you know, it's either a pizza with nothing on it, or it's a pizza with like 32 toppings. And it has no sense of coherence, right? Like I've worked with a lot of UX research teams and they'll come up with this, these beautiful frameworks that's like 12 different ways we could think about the product, right? And the, pro the heads of product are like, dude, just give me a POV. Like, what's your stance? Cut through this noise for me. So that that's the piece that I'm speaking to. We can, a lot of research, we sort of, we can get over obsessed with the clinical side of it, right? Well, well, we overlook the fact there's always inherent bias. So let's actually just name our bias based on where we have conviction. And then let's go and test and validate that. And, and there's great humility that comes in the things that we can learn through that reality check. So just kind of walking things back a little bit. Research has a really important role. It's just, I often find people use it as a crutch of well, we really don't know who we are and we really don't know where to go. Well, research ain't, ain't usually going to be the thing that reveals that for you. Mm. But again, that's my, that's my own, you know, bombastic sort of bias to it. Okay. Now it would seem to make logical sense that you do your research first and then from the research, you extrapolate data points and you say, well, here's the thesis. But from the way it sounds to me, it's like, come up with your big idea, come up with it based on your hunch, your vision of the future, and then use research to validate and to test this to see if it's actually true. So it's kind of an inversion of sequence. Yes. Is that correct, first of all? Yes, okay, it is. And I know a lot of researchers, I piss them off. They, they sure. they're, and it's you okay. know, it's sacrilegious <laughs> to, uh, to, you know, to how people think about the so-called scientific method of yes. research. But what I'm speaking to is the inherent fundamental nature of the way that we actually build narratives and the way that we go about then testing and validating them. But we always have these filters and biases, so we might as well just actually like embrace it. Yeah. I just want to hang there for half a second before Please. we move on to the next point, which is I have a certain amount of disdain for research, too. It's why I'm just not going to let you walk away from this. But yeah. I think the problem is very few people actually do it correctly for the right reasons. Uh, it's usually to justify an expense and because a lot of people's jobs are on the line here. So they tend to do over research built on flawed biased thinking only to produce the results that the researchers themselves sometimes subconsciously, unconsciously are, are looking for. So it's like, you shape the data because you ask the question in a certain way. And then when you go to interpret the data, it reinforces something you already believe to be true. So that's usually where innovation goes to die. Very seldomly do I get research from professional corporations who then hand me, this is the research, Chris. I'm like, there's nothing in here. There's 277 pages of nothingness of marketing speak. Nothing of real value that is an insight. Give me one, like you said, give me one or two insights. Give, give me a point of view. Give me a voice, a direction or something. And research says, that's not my thing. It's not my thing. So 
you want to add to that? We're digging our own graves here. Uh, so I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. And the thing I'm most fascinated with when it comes to culture is like, what are fundamental, timeless, universal truths? Right. And by the way, great researchers know this and they bring those forward. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, some years ago, one of the things that I kind of made, made my name and career was um, I got a call one day out of the blue from a head of product at Facebook. It was the shortest sales conversation I ever had. Um, it's called the French Tech Mafia. Um, this person saw one of their friends, you know, headshots on my website as a former client, and they called up their friend. And was like, "Hey, what do you know about this guy? Your photos on the website," and you know, ends up that they had worked together. So he called me. He's like, "Hey, I heard you did great things for my buddy. Um, you know, here's the situation." So we ended up building the narrative for Facebook groups back in 2016. And in 2016, Facebook groups was a red hair stepchild within the Facebook you know, core app. Really wasn't understood by the company in the world. But they had a new head of product and a new head of design who did some brilliant work, did the ethno, they did the like the foundational research um, of really understanding the product in people's lives. And they had a new roadmap, this and that. Well, anyways, they were then struggling because they, they were drowning in millions of stories of how people's lives had been changed through groups. They didn't know how to build the narrative. So we built the narrative on the structure of belonging in the digital age, right? The, like that's a universal truth that like belonging is this timeless thing. And how is that changing or evolving in this new digital environment what role does Facebook have to play as the biggest community platform on the planet? Well, that narrative had such an oversized influence and impact, it shifted the, the mission and the strategy of the company for more than five years, right? Where literally community building became woven into the company's mission, even became woven into their North Star metric of meaningful social interaction, so on and so on. But it came from talking with the leaders who were running that group, understanding where they had conviction, helping to crystallize that into the truth, and then building the rest of the narrative, including the data that supported the vision of the future that we that we had to convey. If that's a helpful example, and I think that it's our job as leaders, and or if you're you know an agency or creative, a designer where you're uh, you know working with clients. Right, you're a midwife to that universal truth. Um, it's about drawing that forward, but ultimately, it's it's making choices around that, right? Like you you, you get muddled with universal truth when you like you give people an all you can eat buffet of like twelve different truths of what it could be, right? Like that, there's not conviction in that. There's not a point of view, and that's ultimately, I think, what we're what you know most people who are in professional services. We're being hired for our story, and we're being hired for our ability to midwife or steward someone else's story. Um, and the hardest part of storytelling is it's an exercise in choice making, deciding what matters most and what belongs on the cutting room floor. Okay, this is uh, some pretty heady stuff that you're talking about at scales in which many of us will never see in our lives. Let's pull it back down to the individual. I'm a human, or maybe I run a small a five person agency of some sort in the creative space. How do I take any one of the concepts that you've talked about or you're about to talk about and apply that? Like help me ground this conversation and bring me back to earth here. Cause I'm not thinking about the world's largest social network. I appreciate that. Um, so one of the things that I see a lot, um, and I've, you know, I, I struggled with this myself, um, in that for my whole career, I've been, unemployable, right? Like I've always had to create jobs for myself and, and I've been, you know, self-employed my entire life. And one of the challenges that you have when you're an independent solopreneur or you're a small agency is uh, imposter syndrome, like, well, you know, we don't, I'm not the expert that some other people are. I don't have the level of experience yet and so on. So the thing I tend to focus on um, in this kind of full circle back to our opening conversation, it's the following character trumps credentials. And the way that you ref reveal your character, not only is with a point of view, but go back to your origin story. 
help people understand what are the forces that have made you and shaped you and how you see the world, right? Because there's a million designers. There's a million, there's a million creatives. There's a million web developers out there, right? There's a million of whatever trade or profession you're in, but there's only one that, that has your story. And so that becomes the place where you can literally like reveal your own inner authority the more you know who you are and you can communicate that to others. You said character trumps credentials. Yes. It's a nice phrase. Where's the evidence? What are, what's the example? Like, Give us something to support this statement so that we can dig deeper into it. Character trumps credentials. Now, before you answer that, yeah, I was listening to this radio piece many, many years ago. And it said, we used to live in the age of character. Like who you were, the substance of who you were, mattered. Now we live in the age of charisma, where if you're charismatic, you can get away with being a horrible human being. And it seems to be true. And I'm not sure those are the exact words, but it was, there was the age of character. Like we're talking about World War II, you know, the substance of who you are, what you say, what you do, your actions actually can get you to very high positions in companies and, and government. But now it seems it's like the age of charisma. It's like these charismatic people who seem to have all the fun. Let's just talk about, say, some social influencers today who haven't really done much with their lives, but are already millionaires and billionaires because they have a certain amount of charisma, je ne sais quoi, whatever it is that people are enamored with them. Help me understand that then. Yeah, the thing I've been sort of sitting on, because the, the, to me, the most interesting example is a political one that I know is going to poke the bear, but yeah. let's just go there because we're having that kind of conversation, right? So. I mean, take a look at what I literally said, character trumps credentials, right? And there's obviously a big a big symbolic word in the middle of that statement there with Trump. Um, you're bringing up something I think that's really relevant, which is, yes, in our in our in a popular culture today, character and charisma have merged into the same cosmic slop. Okay. Um, and, and in the world of politics, we saw this ever since basically, um, you know, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon kind of first televised presidential election cycle in the U.S., which was at the end of the day, what Americans were voting for was your personality, right? Was sort of who are you as a – so when I say character, I don't mean like Boy Scout character, I mean, uh, like USA Network characters welcome, right? Like the notion of like, like, like be an interesting character, be someone mm. in something that we remember. Okay. Which to me is more of that blending place of, you know, of charisma and then a character, which, you know, ultimately character is simply the way that, um, in, you know, from a screenwriting perspective. The best way that one demonstrates or reveals a character is not by telling us who this person is, but by showing us through the choices and the actions that they take, right? Um, so, so you think about it that way. And the, and the reality is that we're drawn to characters, like versus the credentials. Like, you know, there's a thousand people or a million people that have, you know, an MBA or have this degree or whatever the things are that are the check marks on the list. What we want is someone to tell us a story and a story that we identify with, that we relate to. And Trump did a brilliant job of that, of just, and people, you know, what, if you talk to people who, re, who love Trump, they'll tell you, you know what? He speaks his mind. And I like someone who speaks his mind and he speaks truth to power and he just, he keeps it real. Right. And I understand the appeal to that. I have a great respect for that. Right. Along with obviously the chaos, you know, and the instability that comes with, you know, his style of management um, and everything else. But we have to understand there's a reason why his narrative has such an appeal, why he is such such a character that people connect and relate to. Um, and one of the biggest mistakes that people make with, by the way, things like story is we tend to infuse our judgments as, um, as the corrupting force. Like, like, like AI is a great example, right? Um, AI is not good or bad. It's not right or wrong. 
AI, by the way, doesn't give a fuck about your feelings or my feelings. It just is. It's here. It's not going to go away. The question is, what do we want to do with it? Right? But most of the time, what's happening in the way we tell a story or we interpret a story, we're constantly labeling it. We're, our brain is wired to label things as good, bad, right, and wrong. And that's the place where we're experiencing narrative collapse um, in, in our society and in any organization. Let's go back to the the, the politician, the yes. former president of the United States that you talked about. Let's keep the the judgment out of the conversation. Just yes. look at Trump as a brand. Yes. Let's so we don't have to get here and and, and get half the country super angry at us one yep. way or the other. Okay. Yeah. One thing that that Trump has done is he's understood that it's better to be a flawed person and be real as who you are yep. than it is to be a perfect fake person. And he's he's understood that, and, and maybe instinctively, or just that it's the way he's always been. And he it becomes this paradox, as far as I'm concerned, that he's the most relatable, unrelatable person you know. I'm not a billionaire. I wasn't raised by billionaires. I don't. I didn't grow up with gold gilded toilets and and faucets. So, and he has his private jets. He he's uh, divorced and and marries models and and owns pageants and buildings. How is that relatable? But the everyday person. The person on the farm, person living in the Midwest, even people on the coast are saying like, I get that guy. I might not like all parts of him, but at least he's not fake. And and here's my observation of the left here is they're so worried about what everybody thinks and pandering to one group to the other that they're in the same way, speaking out of both sides of their mouth. Like, can you just be real? If, you, if you're angry about something, just say I'm angry. If, if something's distasteful, just say that. At least then we know where you stand. And in this kind of hyper-analyzed media culture that we live in, no one is going to say something. And the person that does, it's like a breath of fresh air. So we can take this back. We can take this all the way back to people, uh, people who are running a business. If you're a mom and pop and you're running a bakery, if you're running a pizza parlor, whatever it is that you're doing, or running a creative service agency, if you have no story, you are just you're kind of interchangeable. And, and that is the definition of a commodity. And we struggle with that, right? So there, there's this watch, it's the Rolex, right? Or there's a Timex or there's a Casio and there's a G-Shock or whatever it is. And we all have different stories or the narrative about those watches are different. So we're willing to pay more or less because of that story. And so we have to understand that if you don't have character, if you're just a generic cardboard box personality, then you're going to then face whatever consequences that comes with. And it's, it's, you're going to be, oh, well, we didn't get you on this job. We'll just get the next person because there's nothing unique about you. Creative people struggle with this tremendously. And I would love for you to speak to this. Here's what they struggle with. Isn't it about the quality of the work? Shouldn't it just be about that? Like they think it's objective, but it's clearly subjective that my work is better than John's or Mary's. And But Mary is like got a million followers, is speaking on every stage, presumably getting tens of thousands of dollars more, and I can't scrape two nickels together. What's the problem? Help me understand that, Michael. Look, I, I, I have my own version of it as well because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with my craft at the end of the day, our customers, the people we're serving, they, they want to know that there's competence, that there's a process and there's proven outcomes and there's something that they can trust. But most of our customers and those we serve do not want to know how we make the sausage. Um, they don't give a shit about the craft. Um, and, and we, we, you know, and, 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 and I can, you know, this is my challenge because I'm, I'm a story philosopher. I can geek out, like I can split hairs about, you know, the ontological rhetorical structure and framing of something. At the end of the day, people just want to know, like, what does it do? And does it work? Is it going to do the thing that we want? And okay, well, does it make us feel good? And does it inspire and motivate? Okay, great. Let's go. Um, and yeah, so I, I think it's this obsession with craft. The thing that, and, and, the, and I think part of the challenge that you're speaking to is that when you're starting out, the price of admission is learn craft, 
right? You have to build technical competence, functional, like whether it's, oh, I'm good at Adobe Photoshop or, oh, hey, no, actually, I know how to code and whatever those things are. And I see this happening is that we then, we don't realize this, but as you progress in your career, you're going to be less and less involved on the technical craft of the work you know, like in the world of, of tech, it's like you become less and less a product manager. You're more and more a people manager. Like your success in your career trajectory is more and more in your ability to persuade and influence and motivate and inspire and make a business case and negotiate conflict and all these things that are more the soft skills and relational skills. It's all what I call narrative intelligence. Um, but it's a hard shift to make when our identity is rooted in technical competency. Okay. I need to ask you this question. Yeah. And then I have to follow up on the tease that you shared with me, like on our previous conversation yeah. or call. Okay. So let's go here. And then I want to save room for this last one, which is a big one. Yeah. So the question I have for you is this, talk to me about positioning differentiation and X factor and how we can apply that in our business. Those are three really big words, positioning X factor and differentiation. What do you mean? Tell me more about this. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about this, right? Which is, and, and frankly, we are on an accelerated track right now because of what has happened with generative AI. Okay, we are going to increasingly see more and more commodification across all creative industries. And so if you're worried about that race to the bottom of commodification, the only way forward for all of us is to, is to seek and find higher ground. That's positioning, differentiation, and X factor. The most powerful way to unlock X factor, the only thing that nobody can compete against is your story. It's like, you know, your own unique snowflake. And the, the way to unlock and tell that story um, is to, to find something that's at the intersections and that speaks to something that's ineffable. I'm going to give you an example of this um, for everyone. Uh, this is, again, a very tech example. We were working with a, a venture-backed startup that, that's in the developer space, working with developers all around like how you manage your code at scale. Really super, super geeky stuff. And they had just raised their next big round of funding, and they were having a hard time with the narrative. Um, they were all about developer first, the street cred. So they were talking about how this product that sliced it, diced it, chopped it, frappéed. You could do it for breakfast. You could do it for dinner. You know, they were lost in the features and the functionality. And what they needed was more of the enterprise B two B like positioning. Like, how do we sell this to a CTO, a CIO, the executive decision maker? And what we found there was like a step ladder from. Um, so there's three ways to think about this, like um, aspirational value, emotional value, and functional value. And it was moving up the ladder. Long story short, what we got to was a story around developer happiness. Because developers that were using their tool, when they started to use it, they couldn't live without it. And developer happiness was this intangible, ineffable thing that they actually they could position and differentiate themselves against GitHub and some of the other folks that were kind of encroaching on their territory. And it's fascinating, long story short on this, is that the, the executive team loved it, but they didn't have the conviction to own it. They went back to some of the generic things of like developer velocity and developer success but if they had actually gone and claimed developer happiness, that would have been this X factor thing, which was actually, by the way, showed up in the research, talking to the customers and the users. Um, but the conviction wasn't there at the leadership level to live and own and you know to really, really live into that larger narrative. Mm. Okay. The, the challenge I have for you is this. Please. And, and hopefully we do this. And if not, we'll, we'll continue on the conversation some other way. Last week, you asked me this question as we were kind of wrapping up our conversation or whenever we had that conversation. You said, Chris, give me give me 10 minutes or 15 minutes and I'll help you sharpen your narrative because I know you're preparing for a talk. Yes. I've since gone on to do the talk. Everything worked yeah, yeah. out great. And I just want to see you do some of your magic. Yes. Is that possible doing like a 15-minute window where 100%. you can demonstrate your wares a little totally. bit? Okay. Yes. 
So what do we do? How do we do this? Set this up so it's like a home run for you. I can walk everybody through like our signature three-step narrative framework, but to really bring it to light, I would love to workshop with you something that has stakes, something that's meaningful to you where you feel a little bit stuck or like haven't quite got the story straight. The thing that I'm getting close to figuring out is this new mastermind thing that I'm doing called Brand Lab. And it's a big pivot for me because we've been historically serving creative people and teaching them business skills. And then I realize just at the other side of the coin is to teach creatives or teach creativity to business people. So in, in that way, we might unlock something beautiful and wonderful that there's all these frustrated creative people who've lived that kind of left brain life. And I, I wrote this line, it says, helping left brainers think right, the art of business and the business of art. And it's what we're trying to do inside the brand lab. So there's the brand atelier. And what I want to do is help them find their voice, their two word brand to be able to succinctly communicate who they are in the world to tell their origin story. Some overlap here, obviously. And to be able to use that in showing up in the world as a, as a real person that has strengths and weaknesses and not to run away from it. Because I think we're so pre-programmed to just want to fit in and to be like everybody else. It's such a strong instinct and I have to break them from that. Okay, so I want to make sure I get this right mm -hmm. and that we're all tracking along. Um, this is about the brand lab. Yes. And historically... It was about helping creatives develop their business skills. Yes. But what I, if I understood correctly, you're now evolving this to actually help business people unlock their creativity skills. Yes. Great. Okay. So th this is a great example um, for, for everyone that like all narratives are ultimately built and rooted in polarity. Like there, there's a, there's, there are opposing forces um, in some form. This is, you know, rags to riches, you know, this is the, you know, um, uh, you know, get the girl, lose the girl. Like there's always this kind of force. So what you're doing is you're, you're flipping the script, which is a great setup. Um, but now what we need to figure out is um, I want to understand now for this new audience um, what is the, what, what's the thing that's standing in the way of, of you putting out this new story in the world? I don't know. We've, we've launched. It's brand new. Yeah. There is some resistance from my creative community who feel like, oh, you're just leaving us behind, Chris. And then there's these business people who question like, what is creativity going to really do for my business? What are the X and O's on this thing? So that's, that's a hat trick we're going to have to solve. Yeah. Okay. So something, a really important distinction for everyone listening, the moment that one tells the new story, right? So yeah, Chris, you've put forward this new story of we're going to help business people become more creative, right? Unlock their creative skills. Anybody who lives in the old story, which was creatives and building their business skills, people who are in the old story are likely to feel wrong bad, judged, stupid, or defensive. Okay. And, and so now that the, the, the art and science of this is how can we tell the story of the new without making people in the old story feel left behind or that they're not good enough? Right. Does that resonate? Yes. So far. Yes. Okay, great. So, but let me clarify something for a moment. I mean, where does this community of creatives, you're teaching business skills, how do they fit in the new story? They don't. Not yet. Mm -hmm. How they fit in the new story is this. And the way that I'm positioning it is, I come from this world of creative, but it's the place I've played in for over two decades. I'm coming on three decades now. Yep. When I talk to the business people, once they figure out who they're supposed to be in the world and they have clarity around that, they're going to need creative people to help them. That's how we bridge these two worlds because the creatives need clients to work with and the business people need creatives to execute the plan. And so I'm going to build that bridge. Just to clarify something though, because I've seen, I've seen this new platform that you've put out and a lot of this has to do with like the different stage of maturity that a business is at, Yes. right? Um, you're still talking about, though, 
businesses that are in the creative industries? For Brand Lab? Yeah. No. I'm talking about like mortgage brokers, lawyers, uh, people that you would not think that's a creative person. Wow, really? Okay. Finance, realtors. They self-admittedly say like, I'm not a creative person. I'm like, well, I don't think that's true. If we zoom back out a little bit, kind mm -hmm. of widen the aperture, the, the way that you have built and constructed this narrative creates a duality that is us versus them of like, this is who we used to serve and what mattered to us, but now this is who we serve and who mattered to us. And it feels like a binary trade-off, right? It's kind of like plus on this, but it's going to be like, we're going to lose this. And so now the question becomes, is there an even bigger narrative that we could find and tell that's a bigger tent or umbrella that everybody can fit underneath? I think there is. I told the story and it sounds like it's the binary trade-off, but it's not in reality because all the programs that serve creative people are still there. Yeah. And it's my intention. I've communicated this to the people who want to know. I intend to use the new source of revenue to help bolster up some of the creative stuff. And one of the things that I'd love to do, like I, I envision myself as a little bit of a Robin Hood, steal from the rich to give to the poor. Yeah. The rich in my mind are like corporations, right? The, the ones who want to sponsor communities like ours so that it amortizes the cost of yeah. courses down so that it's super affordable to anyone in the world. Or maybe that they want to grant scholarships to these people. It's a long road to get there. And in the meantime, what I have to do is to finance other kinds of creative courses. And so the only way I can do that is to go to the people who want to spend the money, who have no issues with spending the money, and the impact that's created with them will be in exponential return, uh, an X-fold return. So it's not going to matter to them. Yeah. Then we can use those resources to build and create more programs for creative people. And so the, the bridge or the gap between the two are going to start to close. Okay. So what, what, you're, what you've described is the way we all rationalize when we're trying to make a strategic change. And like, I just went through a business model pivot myself from running a seven-figure consulting business to, okay, we're now in the courses, coaching, and community business. And it's been a bloody, painful, like, recalibration. And like, I can get all deep, like, you're in the weeds of the functional, we're moving the Lego blocks to here and this, and here's how this works and so on. And it's where we all naturally go. I want to move upstream to aspiration and emotion. And the thing I want to talk to you about is, is let's come back to your namesake, the future. Because that is a badass name that has that's like the torch that you carry, right? That that has been the the gathering force that bring people together. And so what is it about the name the future? that is so important to you and how is that baked into every, not only everything you've done, but everything you want to do and, and create an offer to the, you know, in terms of like how you serve the world and, and how people benefit from this work. Well, the, the, the name and, and the meaning is, is about looking into the horizon. Yes. Being able to dream beyond what you can see to peer into the night and know that dawn is coming and to be optimistic and to be, um, not, not to have foresight, but to, to kind of anticipate what is to come and to always adapt and to evolve. We, we often end our video podcasts or video episodes by saying, you're not defined by the past. The future is yeah. what you make it. It's a rallying cry to say, you know what? No matter what circumstances you started out in life, which you cannot control, where you go from today into tomorrow is entirely up to you. Where is that in your current like messaging and, and sort of new positioning? It's only in spoken word or like when I speak to people. Because what I would say to you, like my when I when I hear that, that to me is a timeless truth that's baked in the DNA of your work. That is, to your point, a rallying cry that's unifying, that transcends the boundaries and the differences. Um, like while yes, you might have some new ideal customer profile, certain personas, and some of this kind of like you know, funnel related things about like, you know, like the business side of it, this distinction of business and creatives, um, 
this this narrative about the future and the future is what you make it and we can dream beyond what we can see in this invitation to adapt and evolve in this moment which is such an inflection point moment in our economy and in our society like that's the fuck yeah let's go that like transcends any perceived differences how does what comes up for you as i reflect that back to you how does that how do you how do you respond to that thinking about elevating more of this core DNA about the future in your namesake. I, I like what you're reflecting back to me. When we first started to teach, we, we tried to get people to understand this concept and it's a very popular idea is that wouldn't it be great if as creatives we're invited to the table where the decisions are made. So we have to instill within you all these business skills. We have to bring yeah. the business world to you. But there was no guarantee that you would get to that table. It was just an idea. The designer should be there at the front, not at the back, not just to be an order taker. But I also see it now as, as I'm talking to the business people who need this. Well, now I'm at the table. Yep. I can open this door and invite you in. And so now it's the two parts to the, to the puzzle, right? Like we can get yeah. these two things to come together faster, in my opinion. Time will tell if that's true. Yeah where I'm, I'm actually at that table where those people are making those decisions. Now I understand how they work and what they want. And I'm going to invite you to come in and, and hopefully we just accelerate that process. Is it too far of a leap to say you're ultimately like building a, a platform or a marketplace for, for businesses to connect with creatives and creatives to connect with businesses? It's not too far a leap. I don't want to say that word just yet, but yes. I think you were reading what I was sending out, which is they need creative services. My creative people need businesses to transform. It, it, it ideally is a match made in heaven, right? Versus sling it out on uh, Upwork or totally Fiverr, which is yep. a bloodbath. Yep. Okay. So um, how are we doing on time? Because I want to walk you through one more thing if we have the time for it. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. All right, so we, we've staked out a lot of cool territory. I want to walk you through right now the SFB narrative method, okay. which is people have to see it and they have to feel it in order to believe it. Okay, so we've been staking out the territory. We've kind of found some interesting vectors and so on. So the first thing with see it, um, let's talk about, talk to us about how the world has changed and what is now possible that wasn't possible one year ago or three years ago. And this is obviously in, in the context of the audience you want to serve, right? So what's changing in the world and what's now possible that wasn't before? Well, the biggest thing that's changed in the world is due to the pandemic. So remote work, the idea that we can actually work with people that aren't in our city was a uh, there was a lot of resistance behind that. Now it's like, it's just a normal thing. We're also now have a lot of freedom to live and work in places that are not connected to be asynchronous and how we, how we collaborate and how we produce things. So the, the future has been there for, for years. And now the world just woke up like, Oh, we have to do zoom calls. We have to teach online and, and we can telecommute in ways that we thought we always could, but didn't. And now we can. And some other things have, come up i'm not saying in the last couple of years but it seems to be on the upward trend which is business fascination with design and design thinking that's super hot right um stanford has the d school for design for entrepreneurs it's like we're just a little late to that party they've already known this that in each and every single one of us regardless of what suit you put on there's a creative child waiting to play and that's me saying hey, we're not different. We're the same. Just allow me to help them see that in themselves and we're all going to play together. Okay, so I'm hearing the, the pandemic changed a lot. Um, it's broken down certain boundaries or limitations. And, um, you know, with that, I really loved a phrase that you said, which is the future is here. I would really elevate that phrase and explore what does that really mean and look like? What future is here? What is it we can do now that we couldn't before? And widen that spectrum um, across multiple vectors. So the, the technological forces, 
the economic forces and the cultural forces that basically make the future that you see a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's inevitable. This thing that we thought, well, maybe, no, no, no. It, you know, like uh, William Gibson once said, the future already exists. It's just not widely distributed, mm -hmm. right? It's like, so celebrate that. And I think, frankly, a lot of the ways that AI is already fundamentally disrupting creative industries needs to be a part of this as well. And, and, and being able to position and elevate the optimistic perspective amidst the sandwich of suck, right? I know it's scary and there's a lot of reasons to be upset and frustrated, but resistance is futile. It's here. It, you can't put this Pandora back in a box. So the question is, how are you going to adapt to this? And, and that's where, frankly, right, there's, there's this intersection, both businesses, business people and creative people are both like, they, they, you know, we need each other with how we go forward. Okay. So, so we're talking about, we started with see it, which is the context for change. The world has changed. And because the world has changed, we need a new story to reflect that new world. The secret is we have to help people see how change equals new possibilities and opportunities, right? Because most people think of change as just constraint, loss, fight, flight, freeze, defensiveness, like fight back against it. So we need to tell a love story about the future, right? And you've started to stake that out. I think there's probably even more dimensions to that to like really round that out full 360. So that's one, that's the see it, okay? Boom, so that's the big zoom out, help people see. Now we're gonna zoom in. We now need to look at the feel it, which is who's at the center of the story? What do they want and what gets in their way? And this is a challenge, deciding what character, what central character we're going to put in, at the middle, because that affects the perspective or point of view by which this entire narrative gets built. The easy answer, by the way, like the pat answer is you make the customer the hero of the story. You put them at the center. But sometimes it's not so clear who the customer is, or, you know, we have a B to C to B to B story, right? Or we have like, oh, I'm, I'm working inside a company and I have these internal customers and clients and like all these examples, it gets convoluted. But who do you, who do you think is at the center of your story? If you had to pick one central character kind of symbol that would speak to both business people and creatives. Well, that's a tough one. We serve such a diverse group of people. Yeah. Um, What's unifying about like people like back to think back to your namesake? Okay. The thing that unifies this is we're all, we're all creatives. We express it a little bit differently. How we serve people is different, but it's all the same DNA. And the reason why it was such a surprise to me that business people would want to explore creativity was because I just had a pre conception like this is how all business people think and it turns out i was very wrong at least with this group that i'm learning a lot about and it's so fulfilling for me um to encourage that creative creativity to flourish it's like a field of flowers waiting to blossom and when i see well, let's just call a, a suit so to speak and say like oh i have these ideas chris i'm like those are good ideas I never saw myself that way. And you're giving me permission to do this. And hey, welcome to the club, fam. That's actually not two people. It's just one, one kind of person. So what I'm hearing in that, there's, there's some sort of central character, this universal uh, persona or identity, which is I have ideas about what's possible about what we could do, what we could build, what we could create that would make things better for others or that would help fulfill a larger promise. There's something in there, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And so so if we think of, you know, and obviously we could spend more time unpacking this, but we, if we think of that then as a central character, what is it that that character wants and what gets in their way? What's the desire and what's the dilemma? So let's start with desire. What do they want? I, I think this is a universal narrative. 
I think we all want to be aligned with our purpose. And when we're out of alignment, we we know instinctively something's wrong, but in terms of our goals, we're not hitting our goals. We're not meeting our health goals. We're not meeting our relationship goals. And it's something I've been able to experience in the people that I see who are successful in all dimensions, spiritually, in their relationships, in their business, they are really aligned. So I have this slide that I share with people and it's, it's like a recycle symbol, but it's off kilter. So it looks a little bit weird. It's not connecting. And what I want them to do is in their mind, put the parts together. So for me, just to relate it, like I used to make commercials and music videos. It gave me a financial reward, but something was missing. And then when I taught, it gave me a reward for my, my soul, but something else was missing. And when I ran my business, like the analytical part of my brain is like, I'm very happy. It isn't until I put all these three, three things together, the, the desire to teach business and creativity and video production when it comes together in a really neat story. Then I find my bliss. And now that broken, fragmented triangle is now just solid. One of the things that I love about you and I love about everything I've, I've known about your work in the future is you, you have a real pragmatic sense of how do you make things work? And there, there's something really interesting about that, um, which is... Um, there's something actually, I don't know if you're familiar with Landmark Forum, um, but I, I recent, recently experienced their work, which um, is pretty powerful, life-changing work. And it's all about ontology, the stories that we tell ourselves. But there, there's one thing from, one of the things I took away that, that, I, that speaks to the heart of this, which is um, the word integrity. So we often use that word and we weaponize it. We turn integrity into this moral judgment where we make people wrong or it's like an attack. Integrity from a landmark perspective is simply, is, is this working or not working? That's it. And if it's not working, what do we need to do in order to make it work? It's value neutral. There's zero judgment to it. I found that to be an incredible liberating way of looking at integrity. Um, and I bring this up because I, my sense is you're really why, like you're someone who that's part of your character. Like you focus on the engineering of how do we make something work in a manner that honors the creative process and also honors the business process. So you talked about what it is that, 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 that people want is to kind of, is the sense of purpose. Okay. But there's a dilemma there's, there's something, what's the obstacle that stands in the way of being able to live into purpose, whether you're a creative or a business person? I think it's uh, integration. So creative people feel the conflict in that, oh, I don't want to deal with business numbers. I don't want to talk about finance. It cheapens it, it. It hollows me out. And then on the business side, it's like, oh, I'm not a creative person. I don't have that gene. I don't have that panache or the the eye for design and creativity and and so they can't integrate these fractured halves or more than two parts whatever many fragments there are they can't integrate and the story that i love to tell because i'm just a dork or a nerd is i love comic books and my favorite character is the incredible hulk and it's not for what people think it's like the hulk is like it's like um dr jekyll mr hyde in a more popular form it's Dr. Bruce Banner's the most brilliant scientist in the world. Like he's level seven intellect. He's one of the five smartest people on the planet in the Marvel universe. He's super unemotional. He's fragile. He's weak. He's been abused by his father. He has strained relationships because he just can't tell people how he feels. Some, some people can relate to that. But when he gets angry, he is pure emotion turned into rage. And something I, I read about the Hulk recently is the Hulk has unlimited power. The angrier he gets, the more powerful he becomes. So if he reaches a certain state of anger, he is cannot be defeated by any, not by gods, not by anybody. So if you want to take him down, you got to take him down quick. So these two people, one person, it's like this multiple personality disorder and they can't live in harmony. Um, Dr. Banner is fearful that the Hulk will explode and destroy towns and ruin lives. The Hulk 
is always belittling puny Banner because he's his weak point. Banner thinks too much. Banner, stu- you know, Banner trusts too many people. So somewhere in the storyline, Dr. Bruce Banner and the Hulk learn to accept each other and they become Professor Hulk. So then he has most of the strength of the Hulk, the intellect of Bruce Banner. So his emotions and his logic are in order and he becomes a god among men. And now he's no longer hunted. He's no longer a threat to anybody because he's in complete control. They, they come together in harmony. It's why he's my favorite character. Wow. I've, I've never had the Hulk broken down like that for me. And it, um, what I find fascinating about this description is that you're speaking to the inherent, like the inner conflict, right? Which is, by the way, what I think is the next level narrative. So like classical storytelling is hero, victim, villain. It's us versus them, which, you know, heroes. Okay, great. But who wants to be the victim or the villain? Right. There's an inherent nature to that framework that actually does not scale for the world that we're in right now, which is worldviews and value systems colliding. Right. And so you're speaking to something new and different here. And and that inner conflict and, and the, the challenge that we all face is that, you know, in the world of business, if you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one, you know, that truism. And this is one of my biggest Achilles heels, because I'm kind of like you of, you know, into a, to a fault. Like, I'm like, come to Jesus, baby. This is for everyone, right? This is, you know, this is the, the great awakening, like storytelling is our birthright. But th- there's there's this like fine line we have to walk of. Okay, how do we speak to something universal while still making it relatable to the various different people we want to serve? Because we're all walking around with our identity hats on. Um, So, you know, I would I would continue to look at this dynamic of the central character and this tension between what they want and what gets in the way. And yes, purpose. And then, yes, this 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 um, this tension, as you mentioned. um, But the. I would say there's something in there around permission. Like if you talk to a creative about business or a business about creative is everybody has these considerations, the yes, buts, the yes, buts, but, but I don't know this. I don't, I don't speak that language. I've never been good at that. There's all of these like qualifications or considerations that like take people out. And there's something for you, like your work is, actually about getting people to say yes to themselves and say yes to their dreams and say yes to their bigger future. And, and, and I think your gift too is making it, making people feel safe to actually widen the aperture of who they are and what they want and what they want to build and create. And there's something in that territory to me that is an incredible like tent revival, like come on down to the party. Yes, exactly. So much of the times that we're in right now and what we're going to see with the, with the disruptions of technology and especially because of AI, what we're going to see is this evolutionary moment where we have to actually embrace the paradox. Like you, 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 you just, you trying to keep things in a pretty little box, like the, the boxes are disinte- disintegrating. Like to your point, what we need to do is reintegrate. Like we need to reclaim the parts of ourself that we've kind of put on a shelf or the things that we thought weren't who we are and why, like widen the da- dynamic range, right? And as you know, like the journey of leadership, like being a good leader is actually being good at being outside your comfort zone on a more frequent basis. That's basically what leadership is. Like being really good at being uncomfortable, doing something you've never done before and making that your new normal. All right. Same thing that like, you know, the armed forces do special forces, like, you know, heart rate variability, stress response. It's like the ability to be calm and present amidst like foobar, right? Amidst like everything is upside down. Um, And there's something about like, you know, the dojo mindset that clearly is deep embedded in your work. Um, and helping people to widen that dynamic range. All right, so I know we we could we could continue on this forever. I want one last piece to at least stick the landing for you. So we we zoomed out to the see it. 
We talked about how the world is changing, the new possibilities and opportunities that come with that, right? That was zoom out. Then we zoomed in. We really looked at who's at the center of the story. We need someone that we can empathize with, identify with. And we looked at the choice to make there in a way that could be more unifying as opposed to repelling in a way that addresses this paradox right now because you're repositioning yourself in the market of a very different market you want to serve or widen to serve multiple markets. And how can you move into the new without abandoning the old, right? So we've staked out some of that. Now, the third piece to this is the believe it. This is the evidence of truth. So what can we point to that will validate and legitimize the promise that you're selling? Right, This new future of what you're building and what you're inviting people into, what can you point to that's like, oh, business like business people becoming more creative, creative people becoming more business-like? Yeah, duh. It's so obvious to you and like it's possible. What would you point to? What's the facts, the evidence, the proof that supports this promise that you're selling, which is a, a really inspiring and appealing promise? Well, I think there's plenty of evidence that exists already. Um, yeah. I mentioned before the D School of Design exists in Stanford's business school. They're no dummies. I wouldn't bet against Stanford. And they've been doing this for a period of time. You can look at uh, IBM's acquisition of companies that have design thinking in their name or something. They're just gobbling up companies like this. So the left brainers are seeing that the value that design has. And, and Apple is probably one of the most successful companies. Yep that have strong, like have that strong integration of design, design thinking, user experience design, and they lead. And it, and it always boggles my mind that they've been doing this for decades, yet the, the second or third place companies can't seem to match all the quality, the components that they've been able to capture so effortless, effortlessly from product to product. Scratching my head. Marty Neumeyer writes about this and cites numerous studies about how, um, like S and P companies perform that have integration of yep. of uh, innovation and design thinking yeah. and how they perform in just in the market itself. Like they have an X percent boost just because they spend enough money on R and D or design led thinking. So it's already there. It's just they're just at the tip of the spear, or not enough people are recognizing that just yet. It's business as usual. I love that. You're absolutely right, and I've tracked that evolution as well. Here's one interesting wrinkle in all of this, Chris is inside all the biggest tech companies on the planet right now in the last six months. It's fascinating. Not only the big tech companies, but also Fortune 500s. They have all decimated their central design organizations. It's this really weird thing that's going on right now. So you know, UX research has been decimated, but also just design as a function has gotten decimated. And and I've talked to a lot of friends who are, you know, VPs and leaders in those organizations. And a big part of it has to do with this earlier conversation we had, which is design as a profession is too obsessed with craft and not, and not functional or fluent enough in making the business case and being able to translate their work to the executive boardroom and being able to really like make the value propositions and help people understand. And especially now in an environment where, you know, the cost efficiencies of AI, a lot of companies are kind of going like, well, yeah, we're going to start to automate more of this and we're going to start to, you know, outsource more of this. Um, so it's an interesting, the, the, it's a little bit of a step back, but I think the fundamental thesis is spot on and ultimately AI disruption the more and more things get automated and outsourced, basically what, what generative AI I think will do is it will make us better storytellers. It will make us better philosophers. It will make us better creatives. It will make us better ethicists for the very simple forcing function that it demands us to. Because if the machines are doing X, then what the heck is our role and job? Right? It's a fundamental existential thing. And that's where design and creatives at its essence and its DNA is about asking those questions, about looking at the inherent relationship between things and how do we strengthen and improve those relationships. A couple of things I want to say to that. Yeah. I think you're right. When, when we're getting into a really tough economy and things are not going well for, for a lot of companies, the companies that you think have more money than God, when they're laying off people and shutting down departments, they're withdrawing from cities and offices. There's lots of financial problems going on. Yeah. The first thing they do is they slaughter what they feel is unnecessary. 
which is all the creative foo-foo people. And you're also right in your assessment that a lot of designers who are in business roles don't fully embrace the responsibility that comes with making those hard decisions that are traditionally for business types. But I think if we want to create a leader, a visionary of the future, that business and design should not be taught in two different schools and two different campuses by different instructors. They should be taught in an integrated way that's seamless with each other. So when I wrote the curriculum, the future, if you will, it had business classes, it had negotiations, and it had design and design principles, and they're all integrated because why are we talking about this as two separate languages? It's really one language. And, and hopefully I'm the guy who's beating the drum and, and building a parade around this of more than just one. But I want to point out two things here, or maybe at least one thing. The creator economy. We seem to be ushering in a new era that is an offshoot of the information economy where we can see people like Logan Paul getting together with Deji and form, forming some kind of collaboration to create one of the fastest growing sports drinks uh, companies that is going to be worth more than a billion dollars. Here's a guy who's fallen off the creative wagon a couple of times himself, but has been able to resurrect and revive his career and his life into becoming a potential billionaire. Uh, then you have Mr. Beast, who was literally offered a billion dollars for his companies, and he turned it down because he thought it was undervalued. I don't think he's dreaming here. And so there's a whole new paradigm where I don't know how many people graduate from business school thinking like, I have a roadmap in 10 years on how to become a billionaire, yet there are people in the creative space, maybe as far as like high school education in terms of their formal education, who are now on that path today. So I think it's it's a case for both, like business people understanding the need for creativity and innovation and creatives who can play in these open fields and just dominate and crush. Lastly, to your point of AI, I think the future, since if AI can do a lot of what it is that humans are doing today, it will come down to this. I'll just put it out there and let's get your temperature on this. The winners of the future of an AI enabled future will be the ones who have really good taste. They understand what good writing looks like, how it reads, how it flows. They understand what good music sounds like and what what com what is a good combination or a genre of bashing or mashing of things. They know what aesthetically is pleasing and elevated and good taste. Because we can see, you can pump out a thousand iterations of images really quickly, but are they any good? And do you know that that's good or is that the machine telling you it's good? So the curators, the, the tastemakers will be the ones who will be at the tip of that AI revolution. I love what you're saying, Chris, and I do very much agree. The, the way I, I've described this is what generative AI has done is um, it's a forking moment in human evolution. And as part of that now, knowledge is dead and wisdom is queen. Wisdom in one respect is discernment. And that's what I hear as a synonym to as you talk about taste making. It's about being able to make conscious, effective choices to know, again, like a good story, it's an exercise in choice making what matters most versus what belongs on the cutting room floor. The ability to cut through the like signal versus noise and to cut through that noise to have really strong signal that other people identify with and resonate with. Um, there's something else that you said that I think is a really important point for us to reinforce which is you talked about one language. So my, my number one career advice I give to everybody is learn the language of the world you want to be a part of, right? When you speak that language, you belong in that world, you have a seat at the table, but literally language fluency is the path to agency, and everything is language. I've got a trainer at the gym I work with. Um, and I was asking him, I was like, hey, so how many languages do you speak? Because we were talking about this. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, you know, I speak two languages. I speak uh, English and Spanish. I was like, yeah, no, 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 but widen it for me. Like, what are the other languages that you speak, right? Do you speak the language of soccer? He's a former professional soccer player. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I speak the language of soccer. I'm like, okay, great. Well, do you speak the language of uh, functional kinesiology? He's like, oh, well, yeah, actually, that's a whole nother. And he started to realize like every craft, every domain, every sort of area, right, is actually just a language. And that's one of the ways we can bridge this thing of like, oh, no, that's not me. 
we tend to like collapse things down to identity, right? Finance is just a language, right? Uh, graphic design is just a language, but even within design, there's then like how many different dialects? There's a difference between UX design versus, you know, print design versus, uh, you know, web design, so on and so on and so on, right? But language. Um, and the thing that excites me most with generative AI is that words are the new code. We've, we've literally reached this new place at a societal level. Um, there are three of the most important scientific breakthrough revolutions in the last hundred years. One was genetic biological code, DNA, right? The second was binary computational code, zeros and ones. And now we're ushering in this new age where words semantics are the new code. So that's my biggest advice to everybody right now is not only learn the language of the worlds you want to be a part of, but learn language. These are the fundamental building blocks. And the more you develop, uh, the, one of the godfathers of the AI movement, um, uh, his name is Patrick Winston, he used to run MIT's AI lab. He says, um, the three most important fundamental skills of the future is um, an ability to write, an ability to speak and an ability to convey your ideas in that order, right? And this is from one of the godfathers of artificial intelligence. Like we have to build our semantic fluency, work with language, and then ultimately this ladders up to narrative intelligence or that storytelling is the universal source code. Right. Storytelling is it's in every religion. It's like it's it's in it's in every part of culture. It's just literally how we make sense and meaning of things. And I think we're all going to become better storytellers again by the simple notion that we have to because um, we're all going to have to make sense and meaning of what is exponential change. Um, and, you know, the more we can find the opportunities and the possibilities, basically tell a love story about the future um, that's going to lift us up and then lift up the people who are around us. Whew. Michael. Chris. That's been, it's been a really meaty intellectual conversation. There's some words here that our audience is probably looking up and I include myself in there. <laughs> and my head hurts in yeah. the best possible way. I thought we'd do something a little funny yeah. as we wrap up today. Please. Okay. And yeah. we're just giving people a taste of totally. what they can experience within your ecosystem. So before yep. I do the funny bit to end yep. it, uh, how can people find out more about you and the programs that you're running? I appreciate that. So um, you, everybody can find me online at storiedinc.com. Um, we're, we're in the process of refacing a lot of stuff. So probably the best ways to kind of plug into our ecosystem is one is check out my latest book, Story 10X turn the impossible into the inevitable. Um, you can find it on Amazon and on Audible and Kindle. But if you go to storiedinc.com forward slash story 10x, you can download a sample of the book, 70 pages. It's meaty. You'll get right into it. All the things that we talked about broken down. So that's the best, best way to plug in. Um, we have a new flagship course called Narrative Influence. It's a five-week sprint method. We run that every three months. Um, and then lastly, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. That's where I share the most content and in, in musings. Um, Michael Margolis uh, story is where you'll find me there. Wonderful. My guest has been Michael Margolis, and he's written the book Story 10X. It's a beautiful book. I can't wait to dig deeper into this. And if your brain is still possible, like uh, like still put together after our conversation today, I strongly <laughs> encourage you to go visit him, check him out, Thank you. see what's going on under the hood there. Because I, I know we just scratched the surface. Yeah. Now, there's this bit yes. that they used to do on the radio with this show called Frosty, Heidi, and Frank. I don't know if you remember them, no. if you listen to uh -huh. radio. Okay. Anyways, they would do this thing at the end of the show. They would apologize. Like, we'd like to apologize to everybody we've offended, and they would get mm -hmm. into the list. Now, while you're going, I wrote down some things. Yeah. So... <laughs> Okay, so I wrote down, okay, we'd like to apologize to sausage factories, to researchers, <laughs> to politicians, to the right, to the left, to AI itself, and anybody else that you could think of, Michael? Yes. Oh, man. Well, I want to I wanna apologize to Chris. I want to apologize to Chris's mom and dad. Um, I want to I apologize to 
everybody who believes in Trump and everybody who hates Trump. Um, I want to apologize to the Zippo company and to Pawn Stars. Uh, I want to apologize. Um, let's see, who else do we need to apologize? I need to apologize. I need to apologize to chocolate makers around the world. Um, And um, I need to apologize to all of our listeners for indulging me in my brain stretching, heart expanding discourse. Um, Thanks for going along for the ride. Um, I come in peace. Wonderful. And I'd like to make the final apology to anyone who's made it this deep into the episode who hasn't like veered off the road. And there's, there's this expression, the expression is a human mind once expanded does not shrink back to its Mm. original shape. And I hope your mind is expanded today. Everybody just remember one thing. You're not defined by your past. The future is what you make it. 